Well, then that makes you wonder if it becomes an epistemology that says we can't really know anything. Right. Absolutely. But then if you can't know anything, what's the point of critical thinking? (laughs) (laughs) Pointing out to other people that they shouldn't be so dogmatic. (laughs) I guess so. Welcome to Scalé Sisters, the podcast for the classical homeschooling mama who seeks to learn and grow while she's helping her children learn and grow. Scalé Sisters is a casual conversation about topics that matter to those of us in the trenches of classical homeschooling who yearn for something more than just checking boxes and getting it all done. I'm your host, Brandi Benzel. You can come study Charlotte Mason with me over in the Charlotte Mason Think Tank, Go to afterthoughtsblog.net slash think tank to learn more. My co-hosts today are Misty Winkler and Abby Wall. Misty is a homeschooling mom of five, including one graduate. She writes and podcasts at simplyconvivial.com and is the author of The Convivial Homeschool, now available on Amazon. Abby is basically the queen of the Scully sistership. Abby is a country-living farmer, rancher, a loving wife, and mom of five who homeschools and reads whenever she can. Have you joined the Scully Sistership yet? We're really enjoying the current Sophie seminar, Tectonic. Together, we're reading our way around the screen time issue. The goal of the seminar is for all of us to be better equipped to make just judgments about this issue. After all, informed opinions are the only opinions worth having. It's not too late to join us. All you have to do is head on over to scolysisters.com slash join and sign up for the Sophie plan. Today's episode is basically a response to the popular saying that real education teaches kids not what to think, but how to think. We think this is a dangerous false dichotomy. Can we make a good argument for indoctrinating your kids? We're going to try. And so without further ado, let's get to it. Let's start off with our school A every day. Who would like to go first? I would. This is Abby. All right. And I am reading a book with my kids and it's by Bruce L. Shelley and it's called Church History in Plain Language. I have the fourth edition text, but our audio is the fifth edition. So there's a few little extras here and there that I was noticing today because I've been reading along with it. We are taking a online an online um, church history class that a friend of mine came across, and it's free, but it's for high school level. It's pretty intense. I think I might introduce him to Charlotte Mason and the beauty of short lessons <laughs> because <laughs> the amount of work that he is requiring is a lot. So I've been auditing it with my twins because they're not in high school yet, but I was like, this is just a way we can be accountable. And then my high schooler is also taking it. So we thought this would be fun, you know, to kind of do all together. The book is really good. And the other book he assigned, uh, we haven't gotten to yet, but it's, um, it's a Francis Schaeffer's. Oh um, yeah. uh, Um, How that, how shall we then live? No, it's not that one. It's, it's actually a little slim volume and I'm blanking on it right now, but I will see if I can't remember by the end of this. I, I can see it down on my little reading chair, but anyway, um, a different one by Sha- Francis Schaefer, but it should be pretty good as well. And like, he's assigning videos from uh, Ligonier Ministries, like R.C. Sproul on some of the things, but then he had us watch a movie to kind of have the, ina- you know, kind of a, a real life enactment of acts and it's called Paul of Tarsus. I was like, that's it, guys. We cannot devote any more time to watching this movie. It's taking way too long. <laughs> We're done. Like, we cannot do all of these. You're going to have to watch that on the weekends. I can't. I cannot. We cannot do any more school time for this. So <laughs> it's just it's a lot. But sometimes those outside classes do just want to eat up all the time. <laughs> yeah. I, I mean... <laughs> It's yeah. the the amount of reading plus the Bible reading plus the rate, writing assignments plus the video um, things plus the projects. I'm just wow. I'm just thinking wow, 
this might be a collegiate level <laughs> I was just going to say that your story reminds me of when I was in seminary and, yes. but, and I took a two unit class that really thought it should be three units. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So we are late on all of our assignments and I'm fine with it. And <laughs> It's just, wow. I thought the beauty of auditing is that you don't do the assignments. Yeah. Well, <laughs> but it's still like, having, we're trying to do like the discussion points of the questions sure. and that kind of thing. So even that is taking time. Anyway, it's been good. The class though itself is almost two hours long. So wow. Yeah. How many times a week? Just once a week? Just once a week. Just once a week. But um, that's still a but lot. Yeah, it's it's been good, but it is also free. So I am trying to mm. take advantage of someone who clearly has a passion for the history and a love of the gospel and church history and wanting to bestow this on, you mm. know, young adults. So, yeah, it was, it's been good, but a lot of work. Wow. Yeah. Misty, you want to go next? Sure. So I am reading a book called Foundations of Christian Education, Addresses to Christian Teachers hmm. by Louis Burkhoff and Cornelius Van Til. Ooh, so, interesting. Yes. Some, this book has been on my shelf because for a long time, oh, probably over a decade. Whoa. I picked it up at one point because, I mean, it's about the foundations of Christian education. So that's a topic I'm interested in. <laughs> right. And then it's by Burkhoff and Van Til, some classic Dutch reformed names. And so I was like, okay, that seems like a book I should own, but I never got around to really picking it up and reading it. And I admit that it made it onto my list this year because it is small. And I do try to keep an education category in my five by five. Yeah. And I expected it to be dry. And I think that's one reason why I put it off. They are lectures. So they're like transcripts of lectures that were given in the 1920s to 1930s. And I mean, it's, it's not that they're not dry, but they aren't as academic as I was fearing they would be. That's nice. Yeah. They're a nice balance of style, I guess. And I didn't realize the context, but the introduction said for the setting that in the 1920s and 30s, there really weren't private Christian schools, hardly at all. There were parochial schools like uh, Catholic schools and Lutheran schools, but Protestant, like Reformed Protestants anyway, or evangelicals just in general didn't really have Christian schools because they were fine with the public schools. You know, their, their stance really was the public schools are our local schools that we'll be involved with. And so these lectures were given partly to kick off or spur on the Christian school movement. Mm. And so it begins, let's see, the first one is Cornelius Van Til talking about the antithesis in education. So that's the idea that nothing is neutral. Hmm. You are either on God's team or against God's team. (laughs) And so he's making the case that education especially has this antithesis. There is not neutral education. And so I wanted to read this bit. He says, non-Christians believe that the personality of the child can develop best if it is not placed face-to-face with God. Christians believe that the child's personality cannot develop at all unless it is placed face-to-face with God. Hmm. Non-Christian education puts the child in a vacuum. In this vacuum, the child is expected to grow. The result is that the child dies. Christian education alone really nurtures personality because it alone gives the child air and food. Hmm. Non-Christians believe that authority hurts the growth of the child. Christians believe that without authority, a child cannot live at all. Hmm. Thus, we see that the antithesis touches every phase of education. 
to try to enforce the idea of antithesis at one point and to ignore it at others is to waste your energy and your money. We cannot afford this. Wow. So he goes on, it's, you know, about eight or no, maybe 10 or 12 pages on the antithesis in education. And that's in the beginning of his lecture. Uh, you're going to have to bring that quote back for next season when we do our religion episode. I know. Yeah. I know. So that good. One, and even today, well, even a couple of the topics we've touched on yeah. this this time and, and indoctrination, I think this is going to be yep. applicable as well. So Absolutely. Yep. It's you're a little so- bit that kind of slow reading, but it's mm. also short and yeah. every chapter is a different lecture. So then that helps. Yeah, that's nice. Also. Hmm, sounds good. Yeah. How about you, Brandy? Uh, mine, I'm at that pleasant part of the year where I've been reading a little bit in lots of books and now I'm getting to the end of them. And so I'm like, check the box, check the box. (laughs) So satisfying (laughs) after feeling like a non-finisher for so many months. So this one, like, like last time we recorded, this is a book (laughs) I finished. Um, This one's called the moon is a harsh mistress by Robert Heinlein. And I, so one of the things is Heinlein as an author has been on my list for a long time, just because he is kind of like a well-known award-winning sci-fi. Well, he's not kind of, he is one Uh well-known award-winning sci-fi author that I have never read. And he's won, I think four Hugo awards, which is the big science fiction prize. So he, the moon is a harsh mistress is one of his four prize winning books. And so I chose it because I also found it on this random list of what was it? It was like libertarian sci-fi. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Sort of, I'm like, Highland sounds right up your alley. Yeah. <laughs> so, Except for his view of women, but <laughs> yeah, he's a little bit rough on. Yeah. On okay. So I, yeah, I didn't know that. And it was, <laughs> you, you figured it out pretty quickly. <laughs> yes. I, yes, I did. It's uh, least obvious in moon is a harsh mistress. So it's good. I, I was just amazed though, uh, here he yeah. is before the moon landing. And he's invented so many things in his mind, like a moon colony. And it kind of reminds me of, I don't know, like Georgia or something, right? Starts out as like a penal colony, but then people are born there and then it takes on its own personality, right? So you have that. And then you have, he's like invented this whole different kind of marriage, which is a version of polygamy, but is definitely its own thing. Anyway, I just was amazed that someone, I don't know. I was amazed at how imaginative he is. Cause I feel like a lot of sci-fi is really not that inventive, Mm -hmm. but I felt like he was very, it's inventive while also being grounded or rooted in a like understanding of human nature in a way, you know, like it's, he's not uh, idealist in no, mankind. No, not at all. Yeah. And that, I, that I really appreciated because so many books about revolution, you know, like really want. Yeah. As long as we wipe, wipe the slate clean, then everything's going to be great. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and that's the, <laughs> actually the amazing thing, right. Is that they're using the declaration of independence. And so not everybody realizes that because they've kind of just ripped it off because there's no historical knowledge at this point that it's too far in the past, I think is kind of the attitude of the people who know about it, but they're actually using, they're just like wholesale taking paragraphs from it, you know, and in order to make their own declaration of independence from what is it? The federated nations or whatever it is, the nations that are running this penal colony. Anyway, it was fascinating. And, (laughs) um, and a fun read took me forever just because I kept putting it down in favor of things I had to read. Mm-hmm. Is that the one where it's, a, it's something like on the jump, like do something on the jump? On the jump. I don't think so. Oh, okay. But he did. They, the people on the moon do have a weird way of talking there. I, I was trying to figure it out. Like what part of speech are they leaving out? Yeah. And some of it is like articles, like like the or a are sometimes missing, but not a hundred percent. I just, I couldn't quite figure it out, but he pulls off the feeling that they are foreign through just barely tinkering with English, which is kind of an interesting thing. So this is the one where they have a catapult that they use to 
kind of bomb the earth, but they're using rocks. But, you know, if you throw a rock hard enough onto the earth and it falls <sighs> from high enough, it will basically function like a missile. So anyway, it was fun. I also felt like he respected enough of the basic scientific laws like gravity and stuff <laughs> that I wasn't irritated because some science fiction, you know, you just shake your head and you're like, yeah, everybody would have died by now. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> anyway, it was fun. And that makes four out of the five in my category for my five by five that was called Drops of Jupiter, which was my sci fi category. So, <laughs> Drops of Jupiter. Well, it's, it's a, a pop song. It's, it's a also, terrible pop oh. song. You're not missing anything. <laughs> it's not missing anything, Misty. Every time it comes on the radio, I change it. So, it's I like it's, that song, <laughs> even if it is not a song. I do not like it. But anyway, the point <laughs> is that. My five by five challenge doubles as a playlist <laughs> <laughs> with a bad song in it. That's rude. <laughs> rude. I didn't say anything about your song. <laughs> 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 All right. So that we don't throw it down, I will transition. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Abby here to tell you about the sistership. Do you ever feel frustrated with social media? Scroll looking for good ideas, like beautiful pictures, and follow accounts that portray an ideal. But when you walk away, you feel distracted, dissatisfied, and disappointed with the time that you've wasted. Because what you're really looking for is connection and having real conversations about what matters most to homeschooling moms, about educational philosophy and principles, not just superficial and shallow tips and tricks. Well, the Sistership is a place for moms to dig deep into principles and practices, not to waste time. We want to help you connect and find community, not just online, but in real life. The Sistership is private, ad-free, drama-free, and free to join. Find your like-minded sisters today. Go to scolesisters.com slash sistership. Today's topical discussion, I think I have titled this episode Indoctrinate Me. It feels right. Okay. But really it's a response to the saying that floats around and has floated around for years and years, which is this idea that, you know, when I'm homeschooling, I'm going to bring my kids home and I'm going to teach them not what to think, but how to think. Right. Mm -hmm. And we hear people say that all the time. And I'm sure that that is also a worthy response to what they are seeing as effects of the public schools. But at the same time, there's a part of me that's like, well, if we run with that to its logical conclusion, <laughs> then no one knows what to think, which seems like a problem. So what I wanted us to talk about today is related to this, the idea that what to think has become kind of a dirty word. Indoctrination, right, has a negative connotation in our culture, mm -hmm. which really isn't indoctrination, just teaching people what to think. <laughs> Maybe we should start with a definition to make sure I'm right. Am I right? <laughs> well, doctrine is teaching. Doctrine is teaching. Yes. So to indoctrinate is to teach. Yeah. Presumably content. <laughs> <laughs> um, yes. <laughs> I did look up, you know, I forgot. I, I put something here and then it dawned on me. I didn't put the whole thing, I guess. But anyway, it was talking about or is it here? And I'm not reading it thoroughly. Hold on. Let me look. Oh, no, here it is to imbue, imbue with an idea or an opinion was the meaning that was first recorded in 1832. I got this from the etymological online dictionary because I like to see where the words have come from. Mm -hmm. I actually wondered if we could wrap up the whole controversy of not what to think, but how to think in that word opinion that the resistance, like we're starting to say, oh, we just need to teach them how to think and they'll figure out everything. But actually the problem we're seeing in the public schools is that they're teaching opinions as fact, like they're mm -hmm. imbuing with opinions. Do you think that is what the reaction is to? Well, I was looking at 
different definitions of this too. And, and seeing what the modern view of this was. And I came across and it says to teach a person to accept a set of beliefs Ooh. uncritically. Oh, so not to consider other ideas or p- opinions or beliefs, but the archaic term in this definition, which is like the Oxford, I think the new um, Oxford to teach or instruct. So that was what was interesting to me is that it is your accepting of beliefs without thinking about it critically. Which does come back to our, not what to think, but how to think. Yeah. That, that is solidifying that dichotomy as if the two were mutually exclusive, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Cause I'm thinking we don't really have anything to think about unless we have been taught what to think as well. (laughs) Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, and this was interesting in Norms of Nobility, which was just in front of me and now suddenly I don't see it. <laughs> Book Goblin. Oh, it fell on the floor. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there's a chapter, I mean, in Norm, like just the title, Norms and Nobility. Mm. A part of norms is, I mean, it's how you behave, but it's also what's normal, which is based on teaching. And he talks about, it coming from a dogma, which I think is a different way of saying doctrine. Like, Mm -hmm. I think they're similar. They're not the same, but it's a similar idea of having held beliefs. Mm -hmm. And he's okay. Sorry. Go ahead. That you reminded me of something. Sorry. I got excited. (laughs) (laughs) So he's talking about how dialectical education and having a conversation considering all the sides of things is classical, but it actually requires having a position, a dogma. Mm. So he says dialectical education implies that a learner cannot see all sides of a question until he has chosen one. But analytical education assumes that choosing one side blinds the learner to all others. And so I think that assumption is the modern assumption that if you believe something, if you have chosen a belief, or if you're taught a belief, you therefore can't see the other sides or don't have perspective. You have to be uncommitted to learn how to think. (laughs) And he's saying, actually, to learn how to think, you have to be committed. Yeah. That makes sense to me in the context of things like debate. I remember I spent a brief time in high school in on debate team. And one of the things that always frustrated me, you know, is that I would be assigned to represent a view that I did not agree with. But at the same time, I really got to know that view by having to take the position and then try to defend it, which Mm-hmm. in debate also means you're trying to defend it against possible attacks. So you're trying to think about what other people are going to say about it. So you are looking at it from all sides, not just your own side, because you're going to lose if you only look at your own side. Right. Um, but it it really was. I mean, when I look back and think about the things that I probably knew more about at that time, it was those things, the things that I had to defend a position on. Just kind of an interesting thing. I never really thought about that before. What you made me think of, Misty, when you were reading that quote from Norms and Nobility was that the part of indoctrinate that I couldn't remember was that I looked up doctrine. Mm. And so doctrine, at least the original meaning, was the body of principles or dogmas in a religion or in any field of knowledge. I mean, I was thinking about, you know, things like, well, science, there's basic laws of science, (laughs) there's basic principles we want to teach, right? Math, same thing. Anyway, I was just thinking about how, oh, the rejection of indoctrination rightly understood, even if we need to use a different word now, is unfortunate because of this idea that really it's, we're getting into the basic principles of a thing. And how can we even begin to explore a field of knowledge without the basic principles of it? Mm -hmm. I mean, presumably as educators, we want to explore fields of knowledge. (laughs) Yes. Right. (laughs) Okay. So I do have a question. 
when they're talking about critical thinking skills or critical thinkers, right, they're talking about being able to analyze and to evaluate, right? Like those are the kind of the, the key terms. But I was thinking that is this emphasis on critical thinkers, right? The analysis and evaluation, is it based in skepticism? Oh, totally. And is it, is it uh-huh. fruit from Descartes, right? Like that's that's where that skepticism comes from. I mean, I'm sure he's not the first one, but that was that was the big- Defining moment, yeah. Yeah, right. I think therefore I am, right? So, um, but that that is what I was wondering is because- when we are talking about classical education or Charlotte Mason education, we're talking about educating on, on a whole, right? I think even in Charlotte Mason terms, it's a lot about synthesis, right? Rather than analysis. Yeah. Especially I mean, the analysis years. has its part, but years and years, you know, we, we want that whole body of knowledge or, or at least mm-hmm. like you were saying, uh, Brandy, just that we are interested in many things. <laughs> So that, that is one of the things that I was coming away with it. It just seems that it is the skeptic that is approaching these things. I think that's true, but I think it's also true to question how you would think critically without any doctrine. I mean, cause Misty was mm-hmm. just saying that yeah. the uncommitted position is held up as the best one, but then how do you I don't know. That seems to me like there's no place to stand. There's no solid ground in that. Yes. I guess I was thinking today about, uh, I'm doing introductory logic this year. Mm -hmm. We had a thing today about evaluating truth claims. And it's basically, you know, a statement is, is making a truth claim and it can be true or it can be false. Right. So they had to evaluate whether something was a statement and whether it was true or false. And it was interesting how much trouble some people had with this <laughs> because if it was false, they wanted it to not be a statement. Right. Anyway. Right. But the point was really that it, in evaluating truth claims about things they did not know much about, it was interesting how they had to refer to something they did know. And so like, they may not know how tall something is, but they know how tall someone else is. And they know how tall that person or how that tall person might compare to the thing they're comparing it to and be able to you know what I'm saying? Uh-huh. So it was just, I'm just thinking about how like they had to start from a position, even if it wasn't the best possible position to start from. So I just get back to that idea of, because isn't to think skeptically, at least to start with a position of doubt, meaning you haven't grabbed hold of anything yet as true. I just don't know mm-hmm. how you move forward from that. Yeah. Right. Right. If you hold a position, you can adjust your position and add nuance to your position and even change your position. Yeah. Yes. But if you start from doubt, whatever moves you from doubt to certainty, how do you ever get out of a position of doubt and skepticism? It, it becomes almost a, a habit of mind that you can't get out of. Yeah. Well, then that makes you wonder if it becomes an epistemology that says we well, can't really know anything. Right. Absolutely. But then if you can't know anything, what's the point of critical thinking? (laughs) (laughs) Pointing out, pointing out to other people that they shouldn't be so dogmatic. (laughs) I guess so. (laughs) Oh, that's interesting. Makes you a debunker. So critical thinking produces men without chess. Huh? Oh, (laughs) oh. I'm not sure how we got there, but it feels kind of right. <laughs> and we're not even done yet. <laughs> right. <laughs> wow. We've gotten bad. Okay. So, <laughs> um, okay. So I did look up cause we talked about Sayers thing and we talked about yes. how we don't want to dispense with how to think just because we want to dispense with the phrase, not what to think. Mm-hmm. We think it should be both. It should be what to think and how to think. Yes. Mm-hmm. Um, so I did look up the Sayers quote where she talked about, I'm not going to read the whole thing because it's kind of a question, but basically she says, we often succeed in teaching our pupils subjects, but we fail lamentably on the whole in teaching them how to think, which I'm, I don't think is true about our day. I think they don't know what to think or how to think. (laughs) (laughs) At first there was only one part lost and now we're at the point where they're both lost. (laughs) Right. Right. 
which I don't know. I mean, part of me is like, can you teach a subject without teaching people not, or, but without teaching people how to think? I don't know. I, that's an interesting thought. But anyway, so she's emphasizing how to think in her lost tools uh, uh, essay. That is her emphasis. When we get right down to it, that is her central concern. And she believes that kids are swallowing things like advertising whole because they do not know how to think. And if they knew how to think, then they would be protected against that. Yeah. Do you think that what to think also protects them? Well, I think if we are going off of what Dorothy Sayers is saying here, she is not at all saying we should teach them how to think and not what to think. Good point. She's saying right now we're teaching them only information without how to come to a conclusion. And she says, let's go the next step because, you know, her whole, the rest of the essay is like, they should learn information and they should learn how to be persuasive and they should learn how Good to point. argue. Like she's, get, she's saying skills and information and knowledge that they should be gaining yeah. for the point of coming to a conclusion and reasoning and making good decisions. She doesn't have that false dichotomy in her essay, even though she uses the phrase that the kids are not taught how to think. She's saying that there should be both pieces, not that it's one or the other. So I guess that's where you get into that. I don't know. I almost feel like it's the basics form of education where we're going to do the three R's. And we're, so we're just going to learn like these sets of skills and this, per, this certain type of knowledge, and that's good enough. But I don't think there's a, you know, there's not logic. There's not philosophy. There's not, we're just reading, writing and arithmetic. We're good. It seems like maybe that's the kind of thing that she's re- rejecting. Right. Yeah. Which makes sense for the time that she was living mm-hmm. to me and to think about like what kinds of things were happening in schools at that time. I know she was in England, so I may be wrong, (laughs) but well, and I think that part of this argument about people not wanting their children to be indoctrinated, the point comes from both sides, but it is the idea that education is neutral, that you can just get information without that information coming from a worldview from a position. So I should be able, the assumption is that I should be able to be taught knowledge and information that is worldview neutral. The worldview is the indoctrination part, the position. And I don't, you know, a a Christian parent doesn't want their child to get a secular now we would say woke worldview. They don't want them to be indoctrinated in progressivism and liberalism, but they still just want the free education. And so they are trying to separate and suggest give them knowledge without indoctrinating them. And in the same way, the non-Christians would say Christians shouldn't be basically discipling their children that shouldn't be indoctrinating their children because, I mean, that's how you actually pass on your faith and your culture is through indoctrination, (laughs) passing on your heritage and your culture, the whole picture and not just knowledge. It includes knowledge and it's so much more and it's all of it that actually makes up education and it can't be compartmentalized and chunked out to where like, okay, just give me the knowledge part without the, the cultural heritage part. And -hmm. then we'll just add that on, or they should be able to choose that for themselves or whatever. It's, it's not actually the way it works. It seems to me that the real argument is actually about which doctrine. I mean, they can cloak yeah. it in this whole, yeah. I don't want my kids indoctrinated, but actually it's, it's which doctrine and on whose authority. Exactly. It's not neutral. It's an antithesis. Yeah. <laughs> mm-hmm. 
the idea that it would be ideal to not imbue our children with ideas and opinions, I think comes from, is it Rousseauian? How do you say it? (laughs) The assumptions we have from Rousseau that children in their natural state have some kind of internal homing device or individuality that's going to lead them in the right way Mm -hmm. if they aren't overly influenced by outside influences. And that's not biblical or no. classical. Yeah, it goes contrary to pretty much <laughs> all Christian. of Proverbs. Right. Well, that, yeah. I said yeah. biblical. Yeah. Oh, you did say <laughs> there's no conflict there. <laughs> <laughs> My brain is just not working today. Sorry. And Abby, I drowned you out. And I'm very sorry because what you no, were saying okay. was way more fruitful than I was saying. <laughs> oh, I was just saying it's basically contrary to everything that is said in Proverbs, right? Yes. My son, keep your father's commandments, forsake not your mother's teaching um, over and over. Listen to the words of your father, right? Uh, and Deuteronomy 6, right? Yep. Mm-hmm. You shall diligently teach your children, right? Mm-hmm. And we're supposed to be teaching the direction yep. that they are going. Yeah. Well, and here's Proverbs 6, you know, keep my, your father's commandment forsake, not your mother's teaching, bind them on your heart, always tie them around your neck. When you walk, they will lead you. When you lie down, they will watch over you. And when you awake, they will talk with you Mm -hmm. for the commandment is a lamp and the teaching a light. And that's uh, Proverbs 6, 20 through 23. But yeah, Mm -hmm. that, that whole. So we have this other word propaganda. And that actually used to not have a negative connotation also, just as indoctrination didn't used to be a bad thing. Propaganda didn't used to either, but I still am wondering when it comes to this conversation, is there an important difference between, and in, uh, I shouldn't say indoctrinate because those are two different parts of speech between doctrine and propaganda. Hmm. And does it matter for this conversation? the difference between those two things. I think, I think it is fruitful to just look at definitions to try to understand what we're really for or against when we say, you know, I'm for or against propaganda or doctrine or whatever, because one, because the words have evolved over time. Yeah. But also, I mean, understanding what you're actually talking about is the first step of understanding period and trying to make sure that you're using the same word in a conversation with other people is essential because if you're using the word with a slightly different meaning, you are just talking past one another. So if propaganda, you know, when I think of propaganda, I think of false advertising, you know, Mm -hmm. trying to use emotion or false claims to get me to want or do something that otherwise I wouldn't, I wouldn't be convinced logically of it. So you think of manipulation? Yes. I think of propaganda as material that manipulates, but all, I think it's super interesting to notice the connection between the word propaganda and like propagate mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. gardening yeah. and farming. Yeah. yeah. And so that's where I think that historic sense of the word is something that we should, like, we don't necessarily need to reclaim the word propaganda as a positive word. Right. But we do need to understand that in order to propagate the faith, our culture, our family, that means spreading out and increasing and cultivating more and more. So it's not like we are an apple tree and our children are just some kind of generic tree that they get to choose whether they're going to be apples or pears. (laughs) Or like We want to be propagating the same, creating an orchard with the same kinds of trees, not just letting each and every tree choose their own path because that's actually never going to be a fruitful, healthy tree. Yeah. Pruning, pruning the disease branches and pruning so that there is actually fruit thinning things out, right? These are, 
These are real things. Tending. Tending. Yeah. Yeah. And so that in a education, culture, faith, community way that requires teaching in foundational principle ideas and opinions. I think of the, what the Wilsons say that we, we don't just teach our children what the standards are. Our goal is to teach them to love the standard. I love that. And so, yeah, you could be accused of indoctrinating or manipulating your children when you're encouraging them and teaching, training them in the way they ought to go to love the standard, but it's a false accusation. Like it's just unbiblical slander. I think it is tempting for many of us to kind of accidentally, because we're not being thoughtful about it, accept some of these ideas wholesale that the world is feeding us about things like propaganda in the sense of propagating the faith, right? So propaganda is bad. And then you get accused that what you're doing in your homeschool is propaganda. Mm -hmm. It's you are, been a, yeah. <laughs> you're, you feel like you have to back away from that. Oh, propaganda is bad. But the question is, are you even, <laughs> is it even propaganda in the, in the current sense? So like, for example, I looked up one definition. It said that the modern political sense comes from world war one, where they like propaganda was dissemination of information intended to promote a political point of view. So it was intended to pass on a point of view, distinctly political, not even really religious. Right. So it got, mm -hmm. cause it was originally a Catholic term. It sounds like where it was propagating of the faith. That's like right. the 17 positive thing. Right. Yeah. So, but then we get to the 1900s and suddenly it's become like political, like you're propagating a political thing. But I think it just gets all mixed up because we're like, oh, propaganda is bad. And I got accused of propaganda and now I'm scared that that's what I'm doing or something. And I just, I wonder, if, I don't know. I, I feel like I get so mixed up and I see some of these conversations online and stuff. And I'm like, oh, we really need to like, we really need to back up and say first, okay, if I've accepted the proposition that propaganda is bad, is what I'm doing in my home actually propaganda? It might be. I mean, that's possible because one of the things we talked about at the retreat was that even when your conclusion is true, you could be propagandizing somebody. Right. But my question is, well, what does that mean? Like, how would I know if I'm just teaching my children and raising them in the way they ought to go? I'm just being faithful versus I'm propagandizing my children. Like, how would I look at my house and know if I was doing that? I think a part of it would be looking at it and saying, is dialectic acceptable? It's, is it okay? Is it, is questioning and discussing from the various viewpoints a part of the process because you're not afraid? The truth can handle examination. And so what you're, you're both giving the children the truth that you want them to arrive at and showing them how to get there themselves also. And then there is some teaching methods or approaches out there that are just trying to get their kids the, the shortcut to assenting to the truth. But the whole point is simply assent without any thinking for themselves. And I mean, that could, that's propaganda. And it's also not good education. Because that's just, that's like the parable of the soils where the, there's no root, right? It springs up and it can look good momentarily. It's an ascent to the claim that you've taught them, but there's no root. There's no owning it themselves. There's no loving it themselves. There's no multifaceted connection to it. It's just, okay, yep, this is what we believe and that's it. No questions asked that dies away in the heat of the sun. I wonder if also to get back to what I said at the very, very beginning, 
maybe propagandizing also looks like confusing our opinions with capital T, the truth. Mm -hmm. Um, Mm -hmm. You know, like, I'm just thinking about how, or even preferences. Oh yeah. Well, and that is real, I think really important because when, when you get into like certain sort of like narcissistic, abusive type parenting, there really is a, you know, I like chocolate. So you have to like chocolate kind of mentality where it's like complete conformity, even in preferences that goes on. But I guess I was thinking about how one thing I felt like my parents did well, and I've mentioned this before is that if, if I toyed around with an opinion that I knew was probably really under my dad's skin, because he's a very (laughs) opinionated person and I knew it, which is probably looking back, one of the reasons why I was doing it. (laughs) Um, um, Teenagers are so lovely. Teenagers are Um, sanctifying to their parents. (laughs) But I mean, it wasn't just like, no, you're not allowed to have that opinion. It was like, here's a book, get an informed opinion. (laughs) And really like, I remember him starting to do that with me as young as age 10, because apparently I was as opinionated as he was. I have actually found old papers that I was writing for school where I changed my mind after reading those things. But I was thinking about how different it would have been to have been raised in a more, I guess, propagandic type of family culture where I wasn't allowed to question those things. I wasn't allowed to read and think for myself. I wasn't trusted to form my own opinion. And I was never questioning anything that was you know, like you can no longer sign the Nicene Creed kind of, you know what I mean? <laughs> like I was never questioning these non-negotiables of the faith, but I was questioning things that I don't know, perhaps some may consider non-negotiable politically or even like secondary and tertiary type issues or whatever. Anyway, I just feel like being raised by a very opinionated person, what kept it from being propaganda was that I think he recognized that it was an opinion and we had to come to it on our own. Mm -hmm. Well, that is the how to think part, right? And so what we want to remember when we're tempted to use, or if we are just hearing the not what to think, but how to think is that that's just a false dichotomy. It's not either or, but it's both. We need both. We need to know what to be thinking, and we need to know how to think. And we aren't going to know how to think unless we practice that process, which is, you know, I, I like that, get an, unf- an informed opinion. I love yeah. that. <laughs> <laughs> because yeah. then, and he offloaded it. Like he actually took some of that personal element, more emotional element out of it by saying, here's a book, get an informed mm-hmm. opinion. Yeah. It's not just, here's what I think. That's your informed opinion. Yeah. (laughs) You're welcome. (laughs) (laughs) Which is so tempting to do. Oh yeah. It's the shortcut. Yeah. Well, and I mean, really like, I think that's why people complain about the public schools is because it has gotten to where the whole process is a shortcut Mm -hmm. because the kids are just being taught bullet points, talking points. I mean, really like they're regurgitating things. It drives my kids crazy. Like some of their friends that are in public school, because they were, when they ask their friends questions, they cannot answer anything because there's nothing to back up what they're saying. They are just parroting what they've heard in class. And Mm. they don't, because they, because of the way the textbooks are written now, like most of the kids, at least in our neighborhood, like they're not reading anything behind it at all, even bad stuff. It's just these empty bullet point type things, they're catching notions with no substance, Mm -hmm. which is a really strange thing. I mean, I do think when they're older, they start reading things, but they've been programmed from the time they're like in first grade to just do this bullet point approach to things. Mm -hmm. And so the, I don't know, litmus test for even knowing something, much less knowing how to think isn't that a child can regurgitate what you wanted them to learn the facts or the, even the ideas 
where they could say what will make you happy. <laughs> yeah. We don't want that as parents either on our end where, you know, they know their catechism answers and can give them, but they don't really care or they don't really understand. If they don't care and don't understand, then knowing the catechism answers is a liability and not an asset. But then some people hear that and conclude, therefore, we don't do catechism. <laughs> like That's right. not the answer either. It's having a structure and a basis of fundamental knowledge and knowing how to reason and form an opinion from what you know and apply what you know to situations. And with catechism, sometimes being prepared to spend a lot more time than you ever thought you would <laughs> yeah, Abby with the all about that. scripture <laughs> yeah. and the questioning and answering and going back to saying like, actually, a lot of the reasons they wrote these things was because there were some heresies that were going on, like that you're spouting. No. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so just know that when you go down this road and you don't do the shortcuts, the opinion piece, it's, it is wearying. And especially <laughs> if you have an 11, 12, 13 year old person who really enjoys the arguing. <laughs> well, some people are raising lawyers and other people aren't. This is true. <laughs> That's true. Thank goodness he can go do it professionally and maybe That's we can right. just have some peace. Think this way. You're going to get really nice Christmas presents someday and it's all because you let him argue with you. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> because of time. Yes. <laughs> oh, man. Okay. I want us to try to bring this all back together here. So we have this piece of, well, it's not, it's not, it's a false dichotomy. Yes. It's both what to think and how to think. And I think we also have this piece of the world would really love to con convince you that teaching them what to think is bad and that you don't have the right to speak authoritatively into their lives because the yeah. world wants your children to walk away thinking there is no truth. Right. Yeah. That's or right. that the truth is a personal thing and they can live their truth, which is different than the truth. <laughs> yes. And it doesn't have to align with reality. <laughs> right. Oh, not at all. Um, then we have the idea of, but we don't want, when we teach them what to think, we won't, we don't want to propagandize. We don't want to mistake opinions for capital T truth. I'm trying to think about like, is there anything else missing in this conversation before we try to bring it all together? Well, I, I mean, I think going back to that paideia, right? The, the whole life, right? The authority that as Christians, you know, we, we are under authority, we are in authority and, um, this idea of the paideia, right. To nurture and admin, uh, admonish, right. Mm -hmm. That is part of that. What and how as well, right. It's nurturing. It's, it's giving them things and then admonishing when things are going wrong. But I think that that the, holding those two things closely together, right? Uh, because when we get into the very much legalistic, well, you can't think that, right? Um, like we were saying before, you know, this very strict and you're not allowed to have other opinions than what we've done, we, right? That mm. indoctrinating them and you, this is the this is the party line in this family. But that nurturing part is like your family did, Brandy, that bring, giving you books, right? Giving, giving them other voices that possibly, you know, were more convincing than just a, a dad saying, no, that's not right. <laughs> so, yeah. but yeah, I think that that is, that there's a, there's a balance there that needs to be understood because force feeding it isn't ever going to work. But neither is just thinking that, oh, they'll arrive at their own opinions correctly eventually. But not if we're not actually, you know, propagating, right? Tending to that knowledge. What I love about what you said is I think that really what you're saying is what we're already doing is fine and will we'll accomplish the task all on its own. 
reading real books, discussing them, narrating them, reading our Bibles, believing it and considering it authoritative in our discussions, like all of those things are already in the philosophy of education that we all hold. And I mean, it seems to me like the important thing is to not get our heads turned by unevaluated sayings, like not what to think, but how to think. Right. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I'm, I'm realizing lately, I think that there's a lot of little sayings we have that sound nice that are actually not right. (laughs) (laughs) Or critical thinking workbooks. (laughs) Well, it's like they have a, it's because there's an element of truth there. Right. Sure. And so then it's like, oh yeah, not what to think. And then next thing, you know, someone's convincing you that that means you can't teach your children your Bible. (laughs) Right. Right. You know, I think the stakes really are high when we're educating our kids. And that's, you know, maybe one thing that makes us more nervous and prone to doubt or worried when we hear criticism, because, you know, it is a huge responsibility to parent and disciple our children. And if we think Mm -hmm. about it in terms of discipleship, then maybe that helps us bypass some of those misunderstandings in education Hmm. or schooling about what it's supposed to be. Because discipleship is obviously passing on a way of life, Mm -hmm. a full orbed way of life. And education is a part of that. And if we have an educational philosophy, like we talked about in our earlier series, those three episodes, that is almost like some kind of body armor (laughs) that we have then. Yeah, true. Because we are under attack as Christian parents attempting to pass on the faith to our children. And it's not always obvious that that's what's happening. But when we hear those accusations, like, you know, that's just propaganda. And so if we immediately jump to self-doubt and questioning based on the accusations of people who are against us, we're never going to be on a sure foundation. If we have a sure foundation and we know what we're about, then we can evaluate criticisms from a place of stability and security and confidence and say, well, am I, well, what is propaganda? And, you know, kind of go through that reasoning process and actually, you know, practice thinking (laughs) ourselves and not be kind of tossed about by every accusation that comes down the road. I I really want to go to like (laughs) tying it to everyone's racist. I mean, it's the same kind Maybe I shouldn't know. <laughs> Try it. <laughs> well, you know how we just see it more and more and more where, you know, the world has these crazy ideas that are just throwing everything off kilter, like things like all white people are racist. And if they just shout it long enough and loud enough, normal people doing their good work in the world start questioning because they are reasonable. And so they are thinking, but they're taking these accusations, unfounded accusations too seriously and say, well, maybe I am. I don't, I wouldn't want to, you know, being racist is bad. I wouldn't want to be racist. So now I'm just going to operate from doubt and say, well, maybe everything that I know is all wrong. And this, you know, accusations about propaganda are the exact same thing where it's like, well, you shouldn't indoctrinate your children. I said, well, okay, indoctrination propaganda is bad. I wouldn't want to do that. And so we operate from doubt instead of operating from, no, my job is to disciple my my children. And I will do that no matter what the world says or what the world accuses me of. And if I am operating from a firm foundation, I can evaluate their claims and ask questions and maybe say, can you define that for me? Can you give me an example? And, and we can practice that skill 
of thinking when we encounter accusations that threaten to rock the boat, rock our world and make us throw everything out or doubt ourselves. I looked up that verse because you, you referenced that Ephesians verse about being carried about by every wind of doctrine. And I was Mm. like, "Hmm." Mm -hmm. and I looked it up and I actually think it's very perfect for this conversation because I'm just going to read the whole thing from 11 to 14. This is Ephesians chapter four. It says, and he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ until we attain to the unity of the faith of the knowledge of the son of God to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. And I was thinking about this, Mm. that one of the reasons why children need doctrine is because part of being children is that you don't know things. Mm -hmm. And that is why they are tossed about by every wind of doctrine. And I also think about how my own church did not really teach doctrine growing up. And so there were times when I was tossed about Mm -hmm. (laughs) for, for, I mean, even though I was older, right. Cause when he says we may no longer be children, he's actually speaking to adults. Right. Right. So like the lack of doctrine gives you a type of childishness that is not good. Mm-hmm. Right? Cause there is the become like a little child. That's not what this time out. <laughs> right. This is not the good kind of become like a little child. <laughs> the stability that comes from embracing basic truths and holding fast to them is part of what it means to be a mature adult. And to go back to our episode last time, I guess it wasn't last time, but the third one in our three-part series where we talked about raising children to be mature to be adults. Really, this is, I mean, this is talking about being an adult in the faith is to not be tossed about. So it doesn't mean we don't evaluate ourselves because I did like your point about, well, am I propagandizing? Like think for a moment, make sure that that's not the case because it could be maybe, but not getting tossed about, I think is the result of being taught good, solid doctrine. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah. Having a position. Yeah. Well, and there's just so much instability. I don't know. I feel like the last few years, you know, you read the news, ah, you're like, it's like the yeah. Muppets where they like run to one side of the stage. <laughs> ah, and then they run back. And yeah. like, ah. you know, it's like, oh my gosh, <laughs> scary in both directions. <laughs> you know, and It's like, whoo, let's just relax into Christ really mm-hmm. like we don't have to get caught up in the world stuff. That's their game. And that's their game. That's trying to get us all yeah. in a panic. Yeah. <laughs> Growing up in a home, you know, uh, I went through all K-12 and then college at state schools and, you know, government schools and, and everything. So, and knowing that it is a propaganda machine and then coming you know, my conversion is at 19 mm-hmm. while I'm in college and things like that. And then how the chaos was calmed, right? You, you're talking mm-hmm. about a stabilizing influence, but Christianity does, it transforms, but it also is stabilizing, right? Because you do mm-hmm. have these truths to hold on to and adhere to and conform to. And there are standards and expectations and norms. And yeah, we have our different flavors and different um, denominations and things like that. But on the whole, where yeah. there is unity, there is so much stability hmm. as someone who was, who was younger or, you know, a, a young adult who came into that. And that was such a different thing for me. And, you know, as I grew in my knowledge of the Bible and theology, more and more security comes from that. And a l- whole lot less ruffling when I was young and immature, right? Having a lot of milk rather than the meat. It was more, it was more difficult when people said those opinions to me, but as I got firmer on my understanding of biblical truths by reading the Bible and Mm -hmm. reading good theology and listening to more and more sermons, right? Those fearful opinions of others really, really sank into the background. And I didn't worry so much. Mm. Mm. 
I really like wrapping it up with that thought, Abby, me, because, Mm -hmm. because it shows, it reveals how loving it can be to properly put doctrine into our children. Yes. Mm -hmm. And I, right. I, I would never want to lie to my children. Right. Mm -hmm. And I, no parent does. We don't, we don't want to lie. We want to give them the truth and we speak the truth in love always. And, um, it is the most loving thing we can do to our neighbors too. Um, right. To share Mm -hmm. the gospel and to love our neighbors as ourselves by proclaiming the gospel. Abby, were you looking at that Ephesians four passage? No, huh? Because the next sentence after the part about, we don't want to be children being tossed to and fro by the waves and every wind of doctrine says rather speaking the truth in love. <laughs> no, I just, <laughs> no, <Perfect>. I didn't. <laughs> she no, might've totally read it spirit. before. Okay? Yeah. <laughs> totally I not do feel that. like no. she has half of it memorized lately. <laughs> <laughs> starting to suspect you, Abby. <laughs> yeah, like I, like I've read my Bible yeah, <laughs> over and like over it. and over again. <laughs> oh, well, I really like the idea of trying to evaluate what the world says when they're criticizing what our, pro- our project, right. When they're mm-hmm. criticizing classical education or they're criticizing homeschooling or whatever, taking a moment to say, I mean, to be objective, is there something to this criticism? But then also, <laughs> is the criticism just another form of propaganda, right? Trying to mm, stop you yeah. from doing right by your yes. children. Right. So good conversation. Any final thoughts? Yay. Is that your final thought? Yay. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> That's it for today. Thank you so much for listening and being a part of the sisterhood of the podcast. If you enjoyed today's episode, share it with a friend and then discuss it with her. This is a great way to continue the conversation. All of the books and things we mentioned today are linked in our show notes. Just go to scolysisters.com slash SS115 to check it out. Don't forget to sign up for the Scully Sistership and join us for the Tectonic Seminar. Just go to scullysisters.com slash join and become a Sophie member. If you join soon, you'll also get our amazing Sophie Christmas gift. The next episode, which is also our final episode of the season, is our annual Christmas episode. We're going to remind you not to make your house Narnia where it's always winter and never Christmas. Don't be the white witch is both our saying and our hashtag for a reason. And we're going to do this using another one of Misty's beloved Victorian era novels, Little Women. Until then, we want to remind you once again that homeschooling is a marathon you needn't run alone. So open up your eyes and look around you. Find your sisters. Ready as we'll ever be? That's right. <laughs> <laughs> We could sit around, but it won't get any better. <laughs> <laughs> let's start off with the, let's start off with all. Our, oh my gosh. <laughs> twice. <laughs>